Okay, yes, thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm obviously not Josh. Um, he can't be here today. He's asked me to cover this, and actually half of what I'm going to be talking about is work that I've done, and the other half is work that Josh has done. So if it's about schools, I apologise that any mistakes are mine, um, and for the other half of it, all of the mistakes are mine. So, yeah, it's all my fault. Um, so the Thames Discovery Programme, um, for those of you that haven't heard about us, we're a community archaeology project uh, based um, in London on the Tidal Thames, and we work with volunteers to monitor archaeology that's a threat from erosion and damage from boat wash and, and various things all along the river. Um, we've been going for 10 years now, um, 11 actually this year, um, started originally with Heritage Lottery funding, but since then we've been hosted by MOLA, and uh, we also currently have funding for um, projects with, out with outreach with specific communities from um, the City Bridge Trust, which is to work with older Londoners, aged over 75, and Tideway. Um, Tideway are the people who are building the Thames Super Sewer. Um, so they're doing that commercial work and, and they're funding us to um, do some general outreach with the public, but also to specifically work with younger people in London. So we're getting the two age groups there. Okay, so the Thames Foreshore is an incredibly artefact-rich environment. We take it for granted now, but sometimes we'll go down with um, archaeologists from other parts of the country who have never been down there before and their minds blown a bit. We walk over archaeology um, that in any other site would be like the star find. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of archaeology. I think an awful lot of what's on the um, PAS database in London is stuff that's been found on the foreshore by people who mudlark, so they're people who search for artefacts. Um, our project doesn't really look at the artefacts because the, the idea is the mudlarks do that work. They, they're, we're building up basically this record of where artefacts are coming up on the Thames um, and that can feed into the work that we're looking, doing, looking at the structures and the features that you find on the Thames. But, I mean, there's been a wealth of notable finds. These are, these are just some of the things. Um, uh, some of the star finds at the British Museum as well have come out of the Thames, such as the Battersea Shield. Um, uh, there's the Queen Hive Eel Fall. I love the way they're all named after places. There's the Dagenham Idol, which is now back in Dagenham I Museum, actually, which is a Neolithic wooden idol. Uh, a lot of this stuff was found during antiquarian um, finds um, during the construction of bridges and dredging and the docks and so on. Um, lots of weapons as well, as you would expect in a river. But we have a lot of day-to-day -day stuff as well, um, because the Thames was London's rubbish pit for 2,000 years. Um, and an awful lot of bits and pieces come up all the time. And although we don't collect artefacts, we do have a handling collection. And we use that as part of our outreach work. Um, so our work of younger Londoners, this is funded by Tideway. Um, we had funding from 2016, and it's kind of seems to be going in two year cycles. Um, so the second round of funding began um, last year in 2018. The aim of this is to work with children and young people aged between 8 and 18. Um, initially, the work was focusing on working with schools, um, but this has since expanded. One of the problems we had working with schools was that um, trying to find a slot to do work with a specific class that also tied in with the low tide and in a location that the school could travel to was just very difficult. So we're broadening it out to work with other youth organisations and groups across London. Um, artifacts and find handling is, is central to that work. Um, find handling sessions bring the archaeology to you. So rather than trying to coordinate tide times and so on with schools and teacher availability and curriculum and things like that, we can take the foreshore to them and work with them um, on the artifacts instead. And we do do foreshore walks, um, we do family walks, we have, um, we did a um, I think it's 2017, we did a week of activities um, at the Tower of London, working with Tower Bridge on the foreshore there. Um, that wasn't able to happen last year because of the tide, so I'm just going to keep blaming the tides for everything. Um, the, the, these are for schools or for other groups of young people, so we've also been working with scouts and brownies, uh, worked with a disabled children's group. Um, the other thing that we've set up is a, a, a club for younger archaeologists called the Tadpoles, uh, which is our next generation. Um, our volunteers are called FROGS, which is the Foreshore Recording and Observation Group. So if I talk about frogs, I'm talking about volunteers and not the animals. Uh, so the logical next stage when we started to think about work with young people was tadpoles as the kind of young, younger version of that. So they, they, we've had a tadpoles group running for a year and a half now, 
Um, and they've adopted one of the sites on the foreshore at Custom House, and they regularly go down there and, and record it. But they're also looking at the artefacts as well. Uh, so why do we do it? Children are naturally curious about objects. It draws them two things. It's a, it's a, a means of connection. Um, handling artefacts gives them an understanding of the past. It, it brings it to life. Um, in a way that maybe text and somebody talking to you doesn't. Uh, they gain knowledge and can help identify objects themselves. I've, I've, I've worked with Josh on stuff and it's, there's nothing better when a kid comes up and goes, what's this? And then you go, well, what do you think it is? And then you can talk them through identifying it and working it out. And it links with existing knowledge of history in the national curriculum. Um, I work with older Londoners, and this is the work that I've been working on. This was funded by the City Bridge Trust. Um, began in March 2016. This is the last year of the project now. Um, the main focus has been engaging with Londoners aged over 75, which is like the hard to reach group of older people. Um, and we've worked with a, a range of different groups across London, um, lots of different backgrounds. Um, so we've been doing various different things, uh, reminiscence events and using um, finds as a conversation starter. This something that really took me by surprise about this project. Um, we started talking to various older people's groups about what we could do um, and talking to dementia groups and Alzheimer's groups and Parkinson's groups. And um, we tried to do handling sessions. And I can tell you the first time I did the handling session, I was really nervous because I really wasn't sure how it would be received. And I was blown away because what happened was um, the artifacts um, sparked conversations. And the conversations weren't necessarily about archaeology. They just sparked conversations about life experiences, memories, cups of tea, whatever. People were talking. And um, I came out of it and talked to the um, session organiser from the group. And she was like, that's amazing. They've never just sat and had a natural conversation like that before. Um, and the artefacts were kind of the key. Having something to, to handle and to talk about was the key to that. Um, Riverside strolls, so we've been thinking about different ways of um, encountering the archaeology. So getting down onto the foreshore can be tricky for people. Uh, the access isn't great, or quite often they're on badly maintained stairs or slipways. It's muddy and it's slippy, the surface is uneven once you're down there. But the Thames path runs for most of London alongside the river, and there's various spots along there which are relatively step-free or even completely step-free where you can get look over the river wall and you get a pretty good view of the archaeology so we've been doing short walks along the river maybe no more than 15 20 minute walks finishing up at a local cafe and then we'll put artifacts out on the table and again have a conversation over a cup of tea um, and looking at the artifacts um, I do clean the artifacts quite a lot soak them in Milton because um, these groups and um, if all sorts of things can happen to them, um, because they're unstratified and out of the river, I'm not too worried about them. And they're all in the handling collection about the damage that sterilising them does. Um, but yeah, we've been doing other, group, other groups, so U3A groups, local societies and stuff like that, lots of talks um, as well. But like I say, it's the hard to reach groups where we've seen the, the real benefits. And some of that is about the tactile nature of it. Some groups, there will be people in the room who don't have, uh, aren't, aren't verbal, may have soap problems, hearing problems, having something tactile, especially things where you can connect with it. So pottery where you can feel fun prints and things like that, where people can feel that. And really starts, you can see people engaging with it on, on various levels. And why we do it? Uh, finds are a great way to talk to older people. Like I say, it's very tactile. Um, more recent finds spark recognition and reminiscence. I was in a group with a um, dementia group there was one lady who'd been pretty quiet through the whole session and I gave her one of those galvanised rubber bottle stoppers and passed it to her and she goes, oh, it's a Tizer bottle stopper, I remember these. And then we started talking and the, the care worker who was with her had no idea what Tizer was. So then we had a, <laughs> it's a fizzy drink from the 50s and 60s. Um, so then we had a long conversation about fizzy drinks, things that we remember from childhood. Um, how they used to come in stoneware bottles and you could all the glass bottles that you take back to the shop and you know for the care worker this was a whole new aspect of this lady that she hadn't heard about before or knew about before and it was a source of connection because we still drink fizzy drinks today so she you know we could have a conversation about that on on an equal level um, and that kind of thing is lovely it's pipes as well work really well as a kind of a, another thing to talk about because lots of people smoked in the past the smoking's changed now because we vape we used to have cigarettes and so on like that. So, you know, again, that works well. Um, 
And the other one that um, is really interesting I find in London is um, we find a lot of um, shells on the river from shellfish, especially around where the, the fish markets used to be. And um, there's like an East London line where roughly from about Hackney, you um, east, if you go along and take a handful of whelks and cockles and stuff and mussels, people will start talking to you about how they used to eat them. And had one lady tell us how she used to hide the whelks from her mum in her apron pinny um, pocket and the juice went everywhere and stuff like that. Um, so all these conversations and, and, and things, it's very interesting. And again, the care workers had no idea about people who used to eat whelks. You know, there's a real generational cultural differences, I think, sometimes between older people and, and the people who staff the uh, organisations and the homes and things that they live in. And some of this stuff is really helping to kind of cross that divide and help people to have an understanding about different ways people lived in the past, in recent living history. So it allows people to access history in different ways and it creates avenues into other areas of our work with older Londoners. Um, a lot of the groups that I go to, people haven't ever been to museums. They haven't heard of Time Team. I often, just to get a sense of where people are, ask if people remember Time Team and if they used to watch it. And it's, it's surprising, I think. We Often in archaeology, we're talking to audiences that know us and know about archaeology. But when you, you know, if you do a show of hands for that, how many people have never heard of Time Team? And you know then that this might be the first time they've kind of looked at this. And also the stuff like the ties of bottle stoppers, the um, shellfish and things like that, it shows people that when we're talking about the past, we're not always talking about high status stuff, that the everyday stuff is important. The stuff from recent history is also interesting to us. And that, you know, adds value to um, people's own personal past. And it, you know, just kind of um, makes them realize that, you know, this stuff, that their own personal histories are interesting as well, which is really nice to see. And so conclusions. Um, artifacts are crucial to engaging a varied audience. Um, tactile handling is people a sense of the object. Like I say, this, this was really eye-opening for me. Um, it opens up a range of inquiries, both in older and younger audiences. And um, just because something isn't significant to us, particularly as professionals in archaeology, it doesn't mean it isn't to someone else. You know, being reminded that you used to drink Tizer as a kid is a really powerful thing to have. So, yes, thank you.